Requesting connection. Established. Encrypted. We're live. The show you've been asking for. Advice, technology, and community. Linux first, all others second. This is Ask Noah. Live from Multispeed Technologies, the Ask Noah show starts right now. This is the show where we came to do all the things on Linux they said couldn't be done and take your questions on how to do the same. The phone lines are open this hour to be a part of the program. It's a free call, 1-855-450-NOAH. It's one 450 or send an email to live at asknoahshow.com. My name is Noah Chalai. I am your host. Delighted to be here with you as another episode of the Ask Noah Show kicks off this hour. Chaz starts us out from New York. Hey, Chaz, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah, how's it going? Excellent, sir. How can we help tonight? Well, uh, first off, I got to give a quick shout out to the Geek Lab. I finally uh, decided to go ahead and do it and install Ubuntu on my main gaming PC. And a couple of their members were super helpful in helping me get the LVM volume I wanted to set up squared away for uh, my Steam library. So big, big thanks to everybody in the Ask Noah community who helped out on that. Yeah, it's great, uh, isn't it? You know, it's, and it, what, yeah. what's great about that is is it is the listener discussion that occurs 24-7, 365, and there are all sorts of people in there that have all sorts of talents and are willing to help out. They'll help you solve pretty much any problem, and you can join for free just by going to telegram.asknoahshow.com. Yeah, it really is. Anyway, on to the question I was hoping you could help with. So in the interest of this being a very much a turn on PC, pick up controller, and start shooting at things or destroying Rocket League cars or hacking up orcs. All of I my feel. favorite things. Um, I set, exactly. I set, uh, I set it up so that it wouldn't require the password at the login screen. It just immediately logs in and boots into Steam big picture mode. Um, however, there is pretty much instantly a pop-up that says the default key ring wants uh, an application wants access to it and asks for my password to be entered in. Is that just a side effect of not having a login screen? And if it's not, is there any way to isolate what program is asking for access to the key ring immediately and figure out how to get it to back off at least until my first round of uh, gaming is done? With? <laughs> it is a... Uh... It is a function of the encryption of your of saved passwords on the system. So there is a way to disable that, but if you do, then the, the downside to that is your entire saved password list on that computer will be accessible without a password, and there's no way to get around that problem. Uh, but if it's a machine that you're only using for gaming and so you're not saving passwords on there, maybe you don't care about that particular security glitch. Gotcha. I mean, it would, it's a bit of a first word problem i have to enter a password before i can start playing Dude, right no big deal right Just wondering if, if there was if you want to turn it if you want to turn it off the application is called password and encryptions and inside of password and encryption keys you'll see the login key ring and simply change the password and enter nothing is the new password just leave it blank and you're going to get a security warning and say are you sure you want to get rid of this dialogue if you do bad things will happen and your firstborn will be sacrificed and all of that and you click okay and then you're fine well, now that I've gone on uh, the radio and podcast network and told everybody that that's the situation, I should probably keep the password in place. So. Or at least you should probably tell yeah. me that you're going to keep uh, the password in place, yeah. Of course, no, I'm going to keep the password in place. Chaz in New York is going to keep his password in place, so all of his stuff is going to be encrypted, okay? So nobody go to Chaz in New York's house and try to get access to his encryption keys because they're going to be very well protected with a 12 to 16 digit multi-character password that includes special characters, uppercase, lowercase, and numbers. Yep, and the soul of my firstborn and the blood of a sacred animal, too. <laughs> Thanks for the call, man. 1-855-450-NOAH, so, that's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Make your voice heard, become a part of the program. Now, my next guest this hour, his name is Augustine. You may know him better as Mr. Waddle Splash from the Haiku Project. Haiku is a free and open source operating system that is compatible with the now discontinued BOS. It's in the it, Its development began in 2001 under the name OpenBOS, and it was rebranded as Haiku in 2004. Augustine is his name, and he joins me on the Ask Noah Show. Welcome, sir, into the program. 
Hey, thanks for having me. Thanks for taking the time to be here. So for those that aren't familiar with Haiku, give me the 30 second elevator pitch. Give me the background on where Haiku came from. So in the uh, mid 90s, there was an operating system called the B operating system, as you mentioned, uh, which was run by the uh, B Incorporated. It wasn't really uh, something that people were uh, very familiar with outside the technology community. It was almost something bigger, but it really didn't become something large. But for among those who did know it, it was it was the thing. Everybody loved it. There was, wasn't really much of a downside to it. It was great at media processing. In fact, it specialized at it. The user interface was superbly designed. The APIs were a dream to program with. Really, it was just beloved by everyone. Um, but through a series of mishaps, first they were kicked off of uh, Apple's PowerPC clones, and then Microsoft, um, they actually wound up in a lawsuit with Microsoft over anti competitive practices, trying to distribute it to OEMs. Um, and so essentially by the time 2001 rolled around, they were mostly out of money. They kind of bet the farm on internet appliances, which which was really 15 years too early for, and they wound up going bankrupt and their assets sold to Palm, and thus BOS died. Um, but the user community, at least the programmers among the user community, really loved it and didn't want to see it die, and so started uh, OpenBIOS and then eventually Haiku as this uh, project to completely recreate it from the ground up, f just completely and totally from scratch, without reusing anything except for a couple of components that be an open source just before they went bankrupt. But it really wasn't much. So it was a monumental task, and here we are, 17 years later, and we mostly have recreated the whole thing. You know, it's interesting. When I started my Linux journey, it started with, I wasn't smart enough to figure out how to install Linux, but BOS was something that, I was, weirdly enough, was easy enough for me to get up and running. And so that was my, that was actually the first alternative operating system I ever used as an alternative to Windows. So I have fond memories of my BOS days. Um, can Haiku run old BOS applications? Yeah, actually it can. So the 32-bit builds, we still uh, compile with the ancient GCC2 compiler because in GCC3 they completely changed the binary interface and made all the applications compatible and you had to recompile everything. But we compile the 32-bit builds with the GCC2 compiler so that all the system libraries and everything uh, are, can be linked and used against uh, the BOS applications. So BOS applications, even large ones like Go Productive, the Office Suite, and Soundplay, one of the media players, all of them run out of the box and just fine on Haiku. Um, so on, there's, we also use a, we also include the GCC7 compiler, so a relatively new one, so that newer applications that require newer features and the like, such as like WebKit or Qt-based apps from Linux, those can also be compiled and run on 32-bit builds. So you can run bo both best of both worlds, essentially. You talk about 32-bit, uh, BOS was 32-bit only, so Haiku is both 32-bit and 64-bit, is that what I'm hearing? Uh, yes. So uh, in 2012, it started as a Google Summer of Code project, and then uh, multiple other developers picked it up. We do have a x86-64 port. In fact, at these days, it's actually more stable than the 32-bit port for a number of reasons. Um, and pretty much all the apps that we have source code for, so all the BOS applications we can recompile, and then most of the software that's ported, all the open source software we have ported, is available on 64-bit also. In fact, the bare metal installs I have are all 64-bit. I don't usually run many BOS applications at all anymore. Who would you say is the target audience for Haiku? If, they're, if you're looking for a target user base and somebody comes and says, I'm looking at an alternative operating system, Linux isn't right for me, Unix maybe isn't right for me, I'm unsatisfied on Windows, who do you kind of market Haiku towards? So this is actually a bit of a common myth that Haiku isn't a Unix. Um, BOS is kind of a Unix, but not really. Haiku is most definitely a Unix. We use the uh, Unix uh, file system model, the permissions model. We use Unix users and groups. Um, the way this actually a lot of the kernel works internally, so process model and stuff like that, all of that's very much a Unix. So what we are definitely not is a Linux, nor are we FreeBSD, and there's quite a lot of Unixy things we don't do, but in terms of actual POSIX, in terms of the Unix specification, we follow almost all of that to the letter as much as we can. That being said, um, most of our target audience right now is probably people who are already at least somewhat technically inclined and either familiar with Linux or at the very least familiar with having, you know, the, how Linux is put together or at least how to use Linux. Because Haiku is still a little unpolished, it's a little rough around the edges, and so there's sometimes you have to do maintenance on it in a way that not so technically inclined users wouldn't be adept at doing. But that being said, in the pipe dream goal, and in, at this point, unfortunately, it really is just a pipe dream, is to have Haiku be something more broadly usable, so that anyone 
who um, essentially we actually want to be something more like you know an open source Mac OS in a kind of way that whatever Mac OS does as this you know high end operating system that everyone can use even if not everybody does we'd like Haiku to be something like that eventually. So your goal is essentially to create an operating system um, that is that kind of has that top-down approach everything is kind of included and there isn't a lot of choice for the user but at the same time there also aren't a lot of ways for the user to get hurt um, their hand is held throughout that process and so uh, they can install it and and run on a reliable experience the entire time exactly um we definitely won't ever be as locked down as Mac OS is. And we, of course, will always remain open source, so there's that. Um, but certainly in the sense that we have a fully integrated system where all the parts kind of run smoothly together and there's a unified experience for developers working, wishing to uh, create applications for the platform, in a way, yeah, we kind of want to be like a lot like Mac OS in that sense. But also we have kind of the best of both worlds because you can still import most Linux applications. Um, obviously, we follow all the POSIX specifications even more than Mac OS does. So it's kind of the best of both worlds in that we have a a lot of the upsides of Linux and the upsides of Mac OS with not a lot of the downsides of either. You said that you have and you maintain compatibility with applications that were written almost 20 years ago. Can you dive into that a little bit? How is that technically possible with that old of a compiler? So really the only difference between, uh, so really the only problem with the compiler is that it's old, so it, it sometimes falls over and has issues and with things that newer compilers don't, and of course it doesn't have any new features, so I don't know how much you've heard about, say like the C++11 and beyond specifications, obviously the old compiler doesn't support those, but for the most part, I mean, that's just a restriction on us. Application developers, of course, can utilize newer uh, compilers and specifications all they like, and in fact, QT, the ports of Qt and other uh, Linux toolkits and applications in, for instance, our own even built-in web browser is based on a modern version of WebKit, which requires GCC 6 or above to compile. So really, the restriction is only on us in developing Haiku that we use a very limited subset of C++. And in, in that sense, it's really not that much of a restriction. And most of the new features from C++, we wouldn't really use much anyway, especially in the kernel and the like. So at the end of the day, it's not that much of a burden. It gets annoying occasionally, but most of the time, it simply isn't even something that we really have to think about that much. I have to tell you, like, creating an operating system from the ground up, it is a monumental task. And it's one of those things that I look at and I just stand in awe and go, you created an operating system. Like, to me, that is so cool. And you have my utmost respect for the work that you've done. But I have to ask, with the break and backwards compatibility for 64-bit releases, does a project want to continue their blaze uh, on their own trail? Or do you ever see a point where you're going to use an existing kernel, rather that's a BSD kernel or a Linux kernel, uh, you know, so that you guys can focus entirely on the UI design? No, um, we don't. There's been some discussion about this, but really what it comes down to is that using a different kernel or um, even replacing pretty much any part of the system would kind of miss the point of Haiku. See, we're not here just to make an operating system with a different UX or UI than other operating systems, but just a different API for creating applications. It's about the whole system being unified and everything you know fitting together in the right way. And so Linux and FreeBSD, as good as they are, and as good as they are at being kernels or whatever, it, the fundamentally the model of which they work is they stack up software on top of the kernel. So you have Linux and then you have X11 and then you'll have Pulse Audio or Alsa and then you'll have any other number of systems that you have to combine to create the full desktop environment. And removing the kernel and replacing it with someone else's for Haiku would be, I mean, that really is a really big thing. There's a lot of parts of the system that we can make run so much smoother if we use the whole system and develop the whole system ourselves. There's just so much more polish and finesse we can apply to it that we would simply, our hands would simply be tied if we use Linux or FreeBSD or something like that. That's I love that answer, and I love your passion. I can hear it in your voice. I can hear the way that you talk about this project and how much you care about it. And to me, that's always a really good sign of the, of the future and the health of a project is how passionate those that are surrounded with it, uh, how they feel about it and how they express themselves about it. There's going to be somebody out there that wants to get involved with the project. There's going to be somebody out there that says, I'd not heard of this before. I've now looked into this. This is really cool. It's something different and it's something I would like to get involved in. What are some of the primary languages that are used to compose Haiku? So um, most of the kernel and then all of our internal toolkits and then all the built-in applications are almost entirely C++. 
um, which is are pretty different from Linux, where most of the applications, aside from KDE or the like, are written in C, including the kernel. Um, in fact, I'm not sure. I think I think Mac OS has started using some C++ in their kernel. But aside from that, I think we're rather unique in, in using C++ in our kernel. Um, but for that matter, if you're just wanting to start it as like a third-party application developer or just start using Haiku, we, of course, have ports of Python and Ruby. And there's someone's working on a Go port. And, of course, there's PHP. And for the most part, um, there's starting to be language bindings for our internal APIs, for all the Haiku APIs to all of those languages. So for the most part, at this point, you can write applications for Haiku in most languages languages that you can also write applications for um, Linux on. Um, for Haiku itself, it's C++. Um, it's not that complicated C++ either. We actually don't use very much of the standard library at all. Um, in fact, a lot of the code is written uh, so cleanly, and we have enough documentation that we really should write more for internal stuff, that someone with only an intermediate level of experience can get up to speed and start working on the system pretty quickly, actually. If people want to get involved with the project, uh, where what resource would you give them? Where would you send them to get started? Uh, our website, haiku-os.org, uh, is a pretty good place to start. Um, we have quite a lot of tutorials on getting started with the system. We have a very comprehensive uh, manual, an end-user manual for how to use the system and all the different applications and preferences and settings you can apply. Um, we have guides for how to get started with uh, compiling Haiku and then guides for getting started either writing drivers, e both as third-party or first-party drivers. And then, of course, there's a ser couple of series on uh, programming applications for Haiku in the form of tutorials. Actually, there's one which is designed to um, teach people programming at the same time as introducing them to Haiku. Um, and then, of course, we have comprehensive API documentation for our public APIs, and then a set of forms and an IRC channel and mailing lists uh, for those that want to get more involved with the community and you know get up to speed uh, with how things work there. Outstanding. Uh, I, I understand that Haiku is being included in the 2019 Google Summer of Code. That is, that's an impressive feat. Actually, we've been around in Google Summer of Code for quite a while. Um, I think since 2009, actually, was the first year we were accepted, which is only uh, 2007, I think, was the first Google Summer of Code. Either way, we're, we were, we've been in there almost since the beginning. Um, there's only been two or three years where we weren't accepted for any one reason or another. Um, but yes, oh, we generally are one of the few operating systems that winds up getting accepted. Um, and we have a pretty wide swath of products. In fact, our ideas list are, uh, for a uh, potential product is especially long. It covers virtually any area of the operating system, from the kernel to drivers to applications to porting third-party things. Uh, virtually anything that one could imagine in relating to the development of an operating system is on the list in some way or another. Um, so it, it's a very interesting project to work on. I, I certainly encourage anyone in the audience who uh, is considering applying to Google Summer of Code to definitely check out Haiku and see if there's something that catches your interest on our ideas page. I love that. That's absolutely fantastic. Congratulations to you guys for the feat that you have taken on. I have to ask because every geek that is listening to the show is thinking of this in their head, and it's a very unprofessional question to ask a guest. I'm going to ask it to you anyway. Are you familiar with the XKCD uh, comic tech support that references Haiku? How could we not be? I mean, I think I think every haiku developer probably has that bookmark somewhere or another. It's kind of <laughs> it's it's kind of like a badge of honor getting mentioned in XKCD, you know? Well, you're part, not just mentioned in XKCD, but one of the most prolific XKDC, XKCD comics of all time, and in a very positive light, right? Like that is the operating system of true geeks is haiku. Yeah, it, it is. It is pretty awesome. I love it. Augustine, a.k.a. Mr. Waddle Splash from the Haiku Project, the website, haiku-os.org, on Twitter, HaikuOS. Augustine, thanks so much for taking the time to come on the program, talk about your fantastic project. It's something I've wanted to do for a long time, so I'm really thrilled that we had the opportunity to catch up and you had the opportunity to chat about your project. We want to get you back on the program real soon. Okay, thanks for having me. Yeah, we appreciate it. one 450 noah that's 855-450-6624. That is the number to join the program. It is a free call. Kyle joins us from Minneapolis. Hi, Kyle. Welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hey, Noah, good evening. Um, I had a quick question about uh, Linux-based uh, network uh, performance and diagnostic tools. Okay. Um, I recently upgraded from a Netgear router to a uh, PFSense and Ubiquiti-based uh, setup. Nice. And the wireless performance wasn't, yeah, it's been going well so far. Um, and the Wi-Fi performance isn't quite what I um, expect. I was wondering what sort of Linux-based tools you'd recommend for maybe finding the bottleneck or finding the problem or 
uh, doing performance testing of the of the network. Sure, sure. Um, obviously, a lot of the performance testing that we are doing is pr- probably a bit different than what you would do in a in a home, right? And so I'm going to have to answer. I'm going to answer your question from the perspective of of how we do it in in a business sense. Um, there are there are some tools. Uh, I believe it's called uh, Wi-Fi Mon. I'll look up the exact tool and I'll have a link for you in the show notes. But essentially, it will give you some basic information. It'll give you information like your uh, the uh, the signal degradation. Essentially, we measure a Wi-Fi signal, Kyle, in terms of loss. Right? There is no such thing as a perfect signal. So the further away we are from a signal, the more loss we have. So therefore, the smaller the number, the less loss we have. The smaller the number, the better the Wi-Fi signal. Um, and so there are some basic tools that you can use to get the computer to spit out a value that tells you what the signal loss is. And that's obviously the most basic problem is I don't have a strong enough signal. I'm on the opposite side of a concrete wall. I don't have enough power to to push through that. And then you would look at, you know, upgrading your access points or maybe reposition them, so on and so forth. If you want to get further Mm -hmm. than that and you want to start actually looking. So for example, one of the questions that we're asked by hotels all the time how many people can be on the Wi-Fi network? And I can tell you what the manufacturer's recommendations are for a given access point and a given network switch and a given cable infrastructure and all that. But at the end of the day, how many actual active users pounding the internet with Netflix or whatever, how do you test that? And the only, uh, I guess, tools that I'm aware of that will do that is from a company called Candela Technologies. And uh, Candela has a, a whole suite of testing tools and custom hardware that they build for simulating networks, network stress, Wi-Fi network stress. And you have the ability to uh, sit there and and they have a device that essentially simulates, you know, 500 Wi-Fi connections, all trying to stream Netflix at the same time. And you're able to actually quote unquote stress test the network. Now, I don't know if Mm -hmm. I don't know exactly, you'd have to contact them and you'd have to get specific pricing. And I don't know what that's worth to you to, to go in in and test that stuff. I will give you a link to some of the basic tools that you have available because so for example, just knowing a signal drop and you can get a access point positioned in the best possible location uh, with the best possible uh, positioning and stuff that will get you a long, long way. Uh, The rest of the way though, if you still run into a bottleneck, then you're going to, then you're going to troubleshoot a little bit more. The other thing I would tell you is I would start by troubleshooting the wired portion of the network first and once you have determined that the wired portion of the network first is good, then I would move on to the Wi-Fi because there's many more variables that will come into wireless radio technology that don't exist in a wired connection, right? You can plug right into the cable modem, run a speed test, and say, okay, I've got solid bandwidth and a low ping time from the cable modem. Now do I have that on the on the LAN side of my router? Now do I have that through my network switch? And then once you get out to the access point and we've confirmed that you don't have any layer one issues, that there's no wiring issues, now you can start actually looking for the Wi-Fi, which granted that is oftentimes where the problem is. Sure. For, for testing the wired, uh, and thank you for the info, um, for testing the wired network, do you, does your answer change at all? Are there any other, like, uh, any other tools for doing the wired network testing or is it pretty much just an elimination thing like you mentioned? Um, so what I'll start with, I, I always start by eliminating layer one problems, right? So I'll take a, uh, just a plain old cable tester. Mine is a fluke, but there are plenty of them that will do the same job. And, uh, and run a test, make sure you don't have any wires that are crossed, make sure that you don't have any shorts, because that's going to cause you problems, especially if you're go- getting into to PoE stuff. Um, once you've confirmed that all of the wiring is correct, then you start looking at the actual performance of the devices. And so, and I've literally, there's, uh, there are more elaborate ways to do it, but I literally plug my laptop into the cable modem and run a speed test and see that my ping is below... In North Dakota, because it depends on where you are in the country, in North Dakota, I want to see below 20 milliseconds for a ping time to Google uh, and to Google's DNS server. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I compare to what the ISP is selling us and are we hitting within a a reasonable frame of what the bandwidth that we're paying for is. And once I've confirmed that from the cable modem, then I'll plug it into the router and I'll go into the LAN side of the router and I'll repeat that test and it shouldn't really change. Obviously, once you start getting many clients on on the network and they start to put load on the network, obviously that's going to start to fluctuate. So you want to control those variables with as few as possible. Single laptop, uh, single switch, 
single router, single computer, that kind of thing, and and run it. And then I'll go out to the switch and I just walk myself back all the way out to, if necessary, each one of the drops for the access points. Usually what you'll find is if you're going to find a problem, it'll be a faulty piece of hardware, a faulty piece of wiring. If it's not one of those two things, you're likely, you likely don't have a problem with the wired portion of the network. And I'd say 95% of the problems that we find in a given place is with that last radio link. Usually it's because it's not positioned in an optimal place. We're putting access points in concrete buildings that were built back in the 70s where Wi-Fi wasn't even a pipe dream. And then on top of that, the hotel owners rarely, if ever, want to pay to actually drop access points into the room. So they want them in the hallway, which means they're sitting on the opposite side of a concrete barrier between the end user and the access point. And then to complicate things even more, I would like I don't want to ever see any more than 20 dB of signal separation between access points. And what you'll find is most business owners don't want to spend the money that it takes to get proper density in a Wi-Fi network. And so then that gets shorted. Uh, and so you add all of those things up and it's pretty clear why it, you, why you suffer Wi-Fi issues. Um, and those can all be, those can all, all of those issues that I just explained can be done without spending any money. I just can't think of the Wi-Fi tool off the top of my head. There is a free one for Android that I actually sure. probably use more than I use the one on Linux. And that tool is called Wi-Fi Analyzer. And it's a free tool for Android. And the reason that I like Wi-Fi Analyzer is not only does it gives gives me the uh, signal the uh, signal strength of each individual access point for an SSID, but it'll break it out per access point. So if I've got ten access points, it'll give me the MAC address for each one of those access points, and then give me the sig signal degradation. And I'm able to look and say, oh, okay, I I'm. I don't have a strong signal on this access point, but I do have a signal on that access point. So the client would ha be handed off with uh, with zero handoff roaming, and that client would be able to connect with no problem. And so th that's actually probably a better tool. Um, but there is a, a a tool that is not quite as powerful, but it does exist inside of Linux. Okay, perfect. Um, I think that answers my question. Uh, thank you very much for your time. Uh, long time listener, first time caller, and I uh, learned a lot from you and really appreciate the, the show that you put on. So thanks again. Yeah, I appreciate the time. Thanks for taking the time to call in. one 450 noah that's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. Also, Kyle from Minneapolis, welcome to the Ask Noah Show. Hi, Noah. How are you? Excellent, sir. How can we help today? Yeah, um... I have a quick question. Uh, earlier this week in the Telegram group, I was trying to see if anybody had set up NextCloud with Collabra before. It's the uh, online version of LibreOffice. And not a lot of people have, and I've been finding really sparse documentation out there. So I'm just kind of wondering, is it something worth doing? Is it something that you used before and something that you would recommend? I have played with it. Not enough to be able to tell you I'd put it into a production environment. In fact, my experience with NextCloud has been such that I would say it works really, really well if you have a light workload. If you do any sort of heavy file syncing, I the the way that NextCloud handles file syncing underneath the hood, there are some systemic problems to the best of my knowledge have not been changed. And so I would caution you if you're going to sync, I would say files over two gigabytes. And I had a lot of video files that I was editing that were well in excess of two gigabytes. And so I didn't use NextCloud for that. Now, as far as the Collabra suite, that part, in my experience, has been flawless. And I actually had, we had a guest on uh, maybe a month ago or so. And his name is Matt Upsall. I work with him over at the radio station. He's the IT guy over there. And he has used Collabra on top of NextCloud and says it's absolutely fantastic. And he's using it in a production environment and has no, had no issues either. Um, so it's definitely built for production ready and they frank absolutely uh, so, i don't want to say sells it that way but promotes it that way uh so i wouldn't have any hesitation to use the the collaboration and document editing portion of it i would just caution you when it comes to file syncing okay all right that sounds good and then i guess when you've uh, set up that collaborate uh instance as well um has the documentation from the next cloud been pretty accurate and straightforward or did you end up having to do a lot of searching and additional troubleshooting nope in fact nextcloud is one of the best documented projects for setting up there's uh, in fact it's so well documented that a lot of places actually have scripts 
that will set it up. So I'm not sure if Nextcloud. I think that's actually one of the one-click deployments on DigitalOcean. Um, uh, it seems like uh, this might just be me, but um, it seems like their UI got updated, and I couldn't see the one-click deployment. But oh, I you see. can install it as a snap on top of like 16.04 and 18.04. Yeah, in fact, actually, I just looked up the uh, I just looked up the the DigitalOcean guide, and that's actually what they're recommending as well as to install the snaps uh, of Nextcloud. Okay. Sounds good. Great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for the call. one 450 noah That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. The, the Wi-Fi command that I was talking about with other Kyle from Minneapolis is watch space tac n1 space iwconfig. And what that command will do is it will show you each one of your network interfaces. And then it will give you the MAC address of the access point you're connected to. It will give you the frequency that it's using so you can determine the channel. It'll give you the bit rate that is being communicated with that access point, the transmitting power, uh, it, it, and then it gives you the signal strength. So you'll understand what the drop in signal strength is. You want it, if it's going to be usable, I would say it should be no lower. In other words, the number should be no higher than 65 dB, negative 65 dB, maybe negative 70 db but that's probably pushing it a little bit if you get much past that it's i would consider it an unusable wi-fi signal when we do installs our techs are told to keep them below negative 50 db uh and and even that is is pushing my comfort level because you get somebody to the opposite side of a room and that's going to that's gonna they're gonna have a bad time that command again we'll have it in the show notes is watch tac n1 space iw config watch space tac that's a dash N1 space IW config. Again, 855-450. No, it's 855-450-6624. The email live at asknoahshow.com. We go now to our Linux Newswire newsroom with Eric, the IT guy. Here he is. From the Linux Newswire studio, this is the Weekly Roundup with Eric, the IT guy. Hey, Noah. Happy to be with you again. And here are your Linux and open source headlines. USB 4.0 has been announced. The new cable standard boasts a blazing 40 gigabits per second, blowing away the 20 gigabits per second from its predecessor, USB 3.2. This now brings USB in line with Thunderbolt 3. A USB 4 cable will now be able to deliver 100 watts of power and could drive an external GPU, two 4K displays, or one 5K display. However, the increase in speed may be the second biggest piece of this headline. The big news is that USB 4, unlike Thunderbolt, will be an open standard. This change means the cables should become cheaper and more widely available. This change is also predicted to push the development of monitors, docks, and eGPU enclosures. Intel hopes that by opening the USB 4 specs, that it will continue a move towards standardization for display out and audio out. Enterprisersproject.com published an article on how to explain the concept of serverless in, quote, plain English. Since the onset of concepts such as DevOps and cloud, more and more frustration has emerged around the growing collection of marketing buzzwords that seem to be taking over the technical discussion. The term serverless is actually a misnomer. In cloud spaces, serverless refers to the ability for developers to abstract away almost all of the OSI layers. It is not that there are no servers running, they are just being managed by a third party, AWS for instance. This allows a developer to focus on the code instead of managing hardware, installing operating systems, keeping up with the patches, and managing networking or security. So, in reality, serverless refers to realm of control versus actually being code running without a server. The past few weeks, Linux Newswire has highlighted projects that are driving science towards open source. Continuing in that vein, Jupyter Notebook makes the news this week as the, quote, scientific paper taken to the next level. Jupyter has been featured in Linux Journal and The Atlantic in the past few weeks and continues to gain support across science-related organizations all over the globe. Project Jupyter can be used to publish live code examples, visualizations, and equations. Jupyter combines machine learning, simulations, modeling, and data transformation in order to publish open, free production producible results for peer review and education. Its closest competitor, Mathematica, is closed source and extremely expensive per seat, putting it out of the reach of many smaller labs and researchers. Jupiter is just another example of how open source is resculpting the world for the better without the hefty price tag. 
Finally, the biggest headline this week that really isn't a big headline. Linux kernel 5.0 has been released. While many would see this as a huge accomplishment, there isn't much significance given to the versioning in the, from the Linux kernel development team. However, 5.0 is the first major release of 2019 and includes a number of new features, such as a new encryption system developed by Google. This provides a powerful encryption system for low-power devices such as Android and Chrome OS platforms. VRR, Variable Refresh Rates, has landed in 5.0, bringing improvements to graphics capabilities. Improvements in memory management will help prevent memory fragmentation, as well as the addition of the SecComp engine for container security. Check your favorite distro for availability of Linux kernel 5.0. For linuxnewswire.com, I am Eric the IT Guy. Now, Noah, back to you. Chatroom is mentioning Wavemon for uh, troubleshooting wireless networks. And indeed, Wavemon is a fantastic program that does a really great job. I My take has always been I try to keep the minimum amount of software uh, necessary on my computer. And oftentimes, Wavemon is one of those programs that I... I guess I I don't oftentimes troubleshoot a wireless network for my laptop because it it involves walking around a building and collecting information. So honestly, quite frankly, I do it from my phone more often than my laptop. I have used Wavemon in the past, but I found it a, a, a little bit cumbersome, I guess, to set up. But it is an absolutely fantastic uh, piece of software and really, really good for doing some troubleshooting. Also, Nunix is, uh, is uh, suggesting WPA CLI, which I've also used... Uh, not necessarily for troubleshooting Wi-Fi, but I've used it in Xmonad to connect and uh, and configure Wi-Fi. The uh, Wi-Fi analyzer from a phone, uh, Warhead SE, is what I have uh, what I've traditionally used, and I found that to be a really fantastic tool. There actually is another competitor out that I've been playing with a little bit. I'm not as happy with it as I am Wi-Fi analyzer, but it's made from the folks from Ubiquity, and it's called Wi-Fi Man, and it's essentially Ubiquity's answer to a Wi-Fi scanner. It's okay. But uh, I, f I find that I get a lot more information out of the free Wi-Fi analyzer. That's also a program that has been out for years and has gone through a lot of revamps. So uh, I, I found it to be a, a fairly useful tool. But all of them are good, and any of that are open source are absolutely worth checking out. So we'll have links to both Wavemon and uh, some of the others that are being mentioned in the chat room. Of course, if you're not catching the chat room, then you're only catching half the show. You're only hearing the show. You're not seeing it. So you should head over to irc.freenode.net, pound Ask Noah Show, and join the Ask Noah Show chat during the show. I've been playing, playing with a really cool project this week. It's called Bastillion. Bastillion is a essentially an application suite. It's an op open source application suite that generates its own private and public SSH key upon initial setup. You then take that key and put it in the authorized key file of the systems that you want to access. And Bastillion then allows you to share terminal commands and upload files to multiple systems simultaneously. So think of it as a management portal for your servers that require no more configuration on the server end other than adding an SSH key. It has the ability to do ACL, so you have the ability to control access for other administrators and determine what machines they're able to access. It also does auditing, so additional system administrators can be added to their terminal sessions and all of their history will be recorded and audited. Uh, Bastillion can manage and distribute and disable those public keys um, that have been set up within the application, so you have a key management system and you have the ability to remove keys in the event that somebody is no longer should be have access to that machine. It supports two-factor authentication. Right now, they support free OTP and Google Authenticator. Full disclaimer, I have not tried either. I've not been playing with the two-factor authentication. And for me, it comes down to a simple fact of everything in my life is being authenticated with a YubiKey. So at this point, if I can't do it with a YubiKey, I just don't use two-factor authentication. If we were to actually put this into production because of the huge security ramifications that this would have going into production, we would absolutely have to have two-factor authentication. But the thing that really stood out to me and the thing that I really liked about Bastillion is the central user control and the ability to do everything through a web browser. I have the ability to grant access to systems through administrative profiles, which means logging into a website and going into their control panel is all I really need to be able to assign computers to 
given agents. And that is, that's incredibly useful. Once that feature is enabled, users with full privileges, they have the ability to audit other administrative sessions. So I'm able to take some of our upper management people and say, hey, I want you to look into what some of these lower tech guys are doing on a day-to-day basis and make sure that they're A, doing things correctly, and B, make sure that they're not doing anything, um, not just wrong, but malicious. So we're able to ensure systems are managed within the organization. We are able to set guidelines for our technicians, and we're able to kind of manage them that way. Uh, it, it, it does logging, but it also has the ability to send to a central logging server, uh, which I, I haven't played with that functionality, but I think it's pretty cool. The other thing, and this is really neat, and I hope this technology takes off. They have the ability to prevent SSH key sprawl because administrators' keys can distribute uh, those keys through through profiles. And the administrators can be disabled, forcing a key rotation. Uh, and I really, I love that idea because one of the problems that you have, and one of the things that we tried to solve with the YubiKey, is with a traditional SSH key pair, once the private key is compromised, there's no way to ever, I guess, fully re-secure it again. Once it's out in the wild, somebody can make as many copies of that key as you want. You have no way of knowing uh, and managing that that key system. And so the YubiKey solves that in that the YubiKey is a write-only device. There is no way to extract the private key back off of the YubiKey once it's written. So as long as you destroy the original key files when you're creating the YubiKey, it is a perfectly secure system. And you can, you can trust that if the YubiKey is given back to you, that person has lost access to it because there's no way for them to duplicate it. The... This entire system, Bastillion, runs through a browser and doesn't require any client software or browser plugins. One of the things that we constantly struggle with at Alta Speed Technologies is agreeing on technology because all of us have, all of us are geeks and we all have developed our own way of doing things and we all have developed our own tool sets that we like for doing things. And so anytime there is a piece of software that somebody has to install, and I include myself in this description, we get upset about it and we fight about it and say, well, we're going to use this. Oh, let's try that or let's do this. The nice thing about Bastillion is everything runs through a web browser, but it's not insecure. They're using TLS SSL. So the connection from the web browser to the Bastillion server is secure and encrypted. And then it's using SSH on the back end to connect to the server infrastructure. So, of course, that's encrypted. Uh, I have I have found this to be an absolutely fantastic uh, piece of software and uh, definitely something we're going to continue to explore. Now, they have a couple different pricing plans. You can do their hosted version where you're able to uh, play with this stuff off of their website. They also have a live demo that you can play with that doesn't, of course, include any of the authentication features. It just gets you right into a system that you can SSH in around and, and uh, create files and browse around a Linux system right in your web browser. The website is bastillion.io, and I encourage you guys to take a look at it. Check it out. Of course, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. But I would envision that within the next year or so, this becomes a central part of AltaSpeed Technologies and a central way for us to begin to manage client machines because the management infrastructure around this is absolutely unparalleled. And I've seen other systems that claim to do the same thing that Bastillion is doing. Two big problems with them. Big problem number one, they cost a lot of money. And big problem number two, they're not open source. And we're a company that supports open source. And we're a company that pushes open source to our clients. So it doesn't reflect very well on us as a company. And it doesn't reflect very well on me as a leader and as an open source advocate if we use systems that aren't open source. So we've just stayed away from any sort of these kinds of management systems because I couldn't find one that really hit all the nails. And Bastillion seems to hit every one of our needs on the head. So we'll continue to play with that. We'll continue to keep you up to date. And as always, we'll have more links and resources for you in the show notes, podcast.asknoahshow.com. That's where you'll find a link to all of the software that we're talking about and uh, some of the features and specifications and even a free demo that you can take a look. AT Command asks in the chat room, can you still SSH through the Bastillion, through the Bastillion the normal way? So you, you can, I assume, but it kind of defeats the purpose. It, if, so let's say you log into Bastillion and you get access to a terminal. You could just issue an SSH command and authenticate with a password, but at that point, you're now going into each one of those endpoint servers and creating accounts for the technicians to SSH in. 
the whole idea of Bastillion is you create a single SSH key, generate an SSH key and put it on all of the servers. The server logs will simply show that AltaSpeed technology is logged in because it's everybody is using that single SSH key pair that Bastillion generated. But the auditing function inside of Bastillion, inside of their user authentication, where you log into their web UI, that is tracking per user. So if I want to see, let's say I have a web server for AltaSpeed and all of my employees have access to it because I have generated an SSH key pair inside of Bastillion and added that to the web server. If I go into the web server's log, it's always going to show me that Bastillion logged in. That's who it's going to show up from. But if I log into the Bastillion audit control, I can see which specific employee logged into the web server at which specific time, and then I can go back and audit their trail. And uh, so, yes, auditing just moves the auditing up a level. That's a, that's a great way to put it, Warhead SE in the chat room. To me, that's a better way to go because most clients are really, really picky about, as they should be, about adding SSH keys into their authorized key file. They want to kind of have an idea of who is logging into a server. Well, as an IT management company, that poses a real problem for me because we hire and fire people all the time and not fire people, but they quit and move on. And so our staff is rotating from time to time. I don't have time and I don't want to make time to sit down at the beginning of my week every week and go, well, out of the 700 and some servers that we have access to, which three employees do we no longer have this month and which two new employees have we added or whatever and go through and put all of their keys in and notify each one of those customers that we have added somebody or removed somebody. It's just, that's a headache I just don't need. And so the way that we have addressed this problem in the past, we have 15 or so Yuba keys and I've given all the keys and said here, just know that they're employee 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. I want you to add these into your server and we will keep track on our end who has which key. And then we do our own audit system of this Yuba key is assigned to this employee and we kind of track that. So Bastillion automates that entire process and it means I don't have to give them a piece of hardware. I simply have to create them an account. Not that 50 bucks is the end of the world because I still think that two-factor authentication is the way to go. And I like the fact that they have uh, a hardware device that allows them to authenticate. But um, but yeah, so uh, ch check it out. Take a look at it. And uh, obviously, we'll continue to keep an eye on this. I think it's a very cool project and something I intend to explore a little bit more. Now, we're going to try something new this week. Every time we interview somebody who has done anything significant in Linux, there is one thing that every one of these people have in common. And that is that they stress the absolute critical importance of Linux user groups. What is a Linux user group? A Linux user group is a local meeting where a bunch of your Linux friends get together, maybe once a month, maybe more often, and chat about Linux and talk about Linux and become more involved in Linux. The other show that I do, Destination Linux, a good friend of mine, Ryan, he has started what he's calling Coffee on Saturdays with Linux. And they just get together and they drink coffee and they talk about Linux. And it took off like wildfire the very first time he did it. And that doesn't surprise me at all. Why doesn't it surprise me? Because every single Linux Fest, every single Linux conference started with a local group, a local Linux user group. So starting this month, in the months of March, the first episode of every month, we're going to take some time and we are going to do a lug roundup. This is not a drill. Repeat, this is not a drill. This is a worldwide lug alert. Please proceed calmly to the closest lug meeting in your area. It is the first episode of Marth and time for your monthly lug alert. Get involved in Linux. Get involved in a Linux user group. Here are the Linux user group meetings around the globe for the month of March. March 7th, we have Huntsville, Alabama, Clemson, Massachusetts, Akron, Ohio, St. Louis, Missouri, and Fort Wayne, Indiana. On March 8th, Moscow, Russia. March 9th, Lawrence, Kansas, Perth, Australia, Delhi, India, and McLean, Virginia. On March 12th, we have Morgarden, West Virginia. On March 13th, London, UK. March 14th, Landshut, Germany. March 14th, Phoenix, Arizona, Austin, Texas, and Raleigh, North Carolina. March 18th, Seattle, Washington. March 19th, Lauderdale, Florida. March 20th, Jacksonville, Florida. March 21st, Lancaster, Pennsylvania and Baltimore, Maryland. March 28th, New York City, New York. 
And March 29th, we got Sydney, Australia and Grand Forks, North Dakota. A couple that we didn't have time to get to because they're already passed by the time this episode is aired. March 4th, we had Zurich and Switzerland, Annapolis, Maryland. There was one in Chicago, Illinois, and Dublin, Ireland. But if you have a Linux user group, would you please send them over to live at asknoahshow.com? We will get them in our monthly lug alert for a complete list of these lugs as well as links to the event details. Please check out our show notes at podcast.asknoahshow. And like I said, of course, if you have a lug that you'd like us to add, please email it to live at asknoahshow.com. The phone number to be a part of the program this hour is one 450 That's 855-450-6624. The email, live at asknoahshow.com. You can make your voice heard and become a part of the program. I have to know if you guys are interested in us doing an episode from Scale. Scale is coming up at the end of the week. The conference will go Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, I'm not sure exactly what day I'm getting into town. I'm meeting up with a crew that we've assembled there that's going to help me do production. It's going to be a busy time, to be honest with you, because not only will I be doing collecting audio for the Ask Noah show, but I'm also going to try to collect some video interviews that we will publish to our YouTube channel, as well as share on the other show that I do, which is Destination Linux. And uh, some of that will be predicated on the production constraints of Destination Linux. And, uh, you know, that is my friend, Michael Tunnell. He has a very specific way he likes to do things. And so I'll have to see if I can, I can collect interviews in a way that is acceptable to him to air. But if we can do that, that's what we'll try and do for Destination Linux. If not, we'll publish them all of them to our YouTube channel. If you're not subscribed to our YouTube channel, I invite you to do so. It's youtube.com slash Show. In addition to that, though, and in addition to our get-together, which I'll talk about in just a moment, do you want a live show from scale? In the chat room, I'm hearing, just get the interviews, don't worry about the show. And that's perfectly fine. doesn't matter to me one way or the other. The truth is I work for another radio station and I have, I have to do my show on that radio station uh, through the rest of the week. So I'm going to have all of the equipment I need to do a show anyway. It would just be a function of setting up a time, finding a place to broadcast, and then doing a show. But my inclination is to say that what you guys really want out of the show is to spend time honing, getting proper interviews and collecting some real valuable information and not worrying about if it's live or not. So, uh, of course, we have Nunix saying it doesn't matter, just let loose and run BSD, which of course is not going to happen because I'm a true Linux nerd through and through. But if you have a preference on a live show from scale, if that's something you'd be interested in, would you please let me know live at asknoahshow.com or head over to asknoahshow.com and use the contact form to get a hold of us and say, hey, I, I really like when you do live shows uh, from the conference because I don't have the ability to attend these conferences and I like the ability to interact with some of the people and experience the conference from the comfort of my own home. If that's something that's interesting to you, let me know. Otherwise, what we'll do is we will collect video interviews, we will collect audio interviews, we'll bring all of that information back and then we'll play it for you on the Ask Noah show in an organized fashion. And that show, of course, will be the Tuesday following scale, which will be next week. If you're going to be in the California area, if you're going to be in the Pasadena area, we are having a scale get together and we would like you to be a part of that. Now, the scale get together is going to be uh, in Pasadena on March 8th from 6 to 7 p.m. We're going to meet at Slater's 5050. I shouldn't say 6 to 7 p.m. We're going to get there at 6. We'll leave when we're when we're done having drinks and eating dinner and talking about Linux. That's what's going to happen. But it's at, it's March 8th from 6 to 7 p.m. at Slater's 5050, and that's uh, 61 North Raymond Avenue in Pasadena, California. We would love you to come out and hang out with us and chat about some Linux. We're also going to have a Destination Linux presence. Ryan was kind enough to send me some swag from Destination Linux, so if you want bumper stickers, if you want DOS Geek uh, swag, which... If I'm not mistaken, it's the only place you're going to get it is in person because I don't think he's got a store set up yet. So if you want the first DOS Geek Fill Your Brains squeegee thing, which I have right here in the studio and play with the entire show, it keeps me sane, uh, then you'll want to meet up with us. Now, we are we could use the proprietary garbage alternative that you have to pay money for, but who would want to do that? Come on now, we're Linux users, right? So we are hosting this on gettogether.community. That's Get Together. Dot community. We'll have a link for you in the show notes. If you're going to be there, would you please register for an account and let us know? We're going to be hosting more of these. Every time we do a Linux Fest, Southeast Linux Fest, we will have one. North uh, Linux Fest Northwest, we're going to have one. 
every time we go somewhere, we're going to host one of these get-togethers. So you can stay up to date by joining gettogether.community. Additionally, if you happen to be in the Grand Forks area or somewhere close within, we got two calls from Minneapolis today. We are going to start a Linux user group. That's going to be the last Friday of every month at the moment. And we're going to meet out at the university. So if you're interested in participating in that, we would love to have you. And more details will be available at the community get together. You can, we've actually purchased a URL. So you can just go to gfklinux.org. That's gfklinux.org. Of course, we'll have a link for you in the show notes. And we would love to meet up with you. One of the things that I'm so excited about, I love being the dumbest person in the room and scale is an opportunity for me to do that scale is an opportunity and linux fest northwest and southeast linux fest they're all opportunities for me to meet up and hang out with people that are far smarter than i am and fundamentally what it allows me to do is make connections for this show and it allows me to when we have people on the show uh, a lot of the interviews that you hear are from our producer uh, q5 sys and i met him at linux fest northwest and we have since grown a, a close friendship at Southeast Linux Fest because both him and I are, are staff there. Uh, Warhead SE, who you've heard on the program before, met him at Southeast Linux Fest. A lot of the connections that we have and a lot of the people that we have on the show are on the show because of the connections that are made at these conferences. And so I would encourage you in the strongest possible terms, if you have the ability to attend a Linux Fest, please do so. Um because I, 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 I just can't speak highly enough about them. Did you know this episode is a, is down is available as a downloadable podcast? To subscribe to the feed or download the latest episode, visit podcast.asknoahshow. There you'll find not only the latest episode, but all of the articles and material referenced in this episode. You can get the latest, of course, by following us on Twitter, at Ask Noah Show. The Ask Noah Show continues next Tuesday at 6 p.m. Central. A huge thanks to Vox Telesis for providing our phone system. Ben, our producer, Sarah, our call screener. Also, would you please follow me on Twitter personally, at Colonel Linux. I tweet out fun things from time to time and a couple of nerd things. This hour of the show may be over, but there's plenty more content for you. That's no show. We'll see you next week.